Thank you, Evan and Lily, for inviting us and all of you so many for coming. Um, it's always nice to be in a beautiful crowd. Um, tonight, we're not going to hear a lecture directly about our work, but more about the context of our work, and uh, especially about our couple of latest projects, uh, which, was, which were focusing on automation. And in this lecture, we try to ask if in this uh, race of efficiency and velocity of data processing, which we're going to lose anyway, uh, we can turn to other things like mistake, contingency, failure, and look for positive things in, in these seemingly bad, um, bad things. So uh, this lecture is a mixture of our work, uh, our research material, references, and it's basically a walk through our heads and our desktops. So, yeah, enjoy. And uh, looking forward for the questions afterwards. <coughs> Technology was born out of contingency, of memory glitch. At least if we go along with the French philosopher, Bernard Stiegler, who used the ancient Greek myth of Prometheus and his forgetful brother, Epimetheus, man, techniques, and contingency into one inseparable mashup. Epimetheus distributed all positive traits to animals, and when man turns came, he found his bag empty. This man was left with no positive traits, like sharp teeth, fast leg, thick skin, or fur. Man was left naked and shoeless, and without bedding, and without weapons. The fire that Prometheus gave mankind is a compensation for this accident, this memory failure. Accident is the basic condition of progress. Following up on Stiegler analysis, the Chinese media theorist, Yu Kui, came up on the relationship between contingency and technology in the writings of Aristotle, who identified two types of contingency, Greek words, tuke and the automaton. While the former is known to denote luck, the automaton is often translated as spontaneity, making automaticity etymologically and ontologically interrogated with spontaneity. Tuke, as we know, refers both to contingency and to luck. The automaton is often translated as spontaneity. The automaton, however, not only refers to spontaneity, but also to the automatic. The automatic in the sense that it's already within the possibility of being itself. Yet is spontaneity automated? Is it possible to program? Or is it, after all, attributed to organic body-mind creatures only? Yukui attributes contingency to uncontrollable nature. Consequently, the birth of science is the result of constant attempts to control contingency, or at least to subordinate it for one's, for one's interests. However, the contingencies generated by technology itself do belong to second nature, which does not oppose nature, but rather contains it. This way, nature, technology, and contingency form an undivided assemblage that results not only in positive unexpected trends of technological development, but also actual catastrophes, such as we can see in the example of Fukushima in 2011. The tsunami <coughs> is not really the cause of, of the catastrophe, but rather part of the cause. That is to say, the contingency of natural law, which includes natural disaster or material failure, cannot alone explain the catastrophe, since nature, the sea, is integrated in the technological system as a cooling agent of the nuclear plant. This fusion of nature, technology, and contingency becomes all the more important as human activities are increasingly delegated to our automated companions. Both personal space and industry get more and more automated. Man operates alongside non-human programmable entities at home and at work. In theory, this automation is also called the fourth technological revolution, when intelligent mechanisms largely interact with each other without human intervention. Repetitive and physically demanding labor is replaced by robotic choreography, leaving man in charge of the more virtual part of the system, programming, and providing internet and power supply to his automated co-workers.
fans by including more and more mechanized actors. Nevertheless, the rapid spread and implementation of automated agents often highlights and deepens existing socioeconomic problems. With automation, some bodies are going to be more vulnerable than others, thus revealing once again the complicating social situation, usually determined by sexual and racial policies. In any case, automation urges ones to rethink and replace the prevalent idea of work as a major social value. In September 2013, two Oxford researchers, Carl Benedict Frey and Michael A. Osborne, published The Future of Employment, in which they surveyed the likelihood of different professions being taken over by computer algorithms within the next 20 years. And they estimated that 47% of US jobs are at high risk. For example, there's a 99% probability that by 2033, human telemarketers and insurance underwriters will lose their job to algorithms. There is a 98% probability that the same will happen to sports referees. Cashiers, 97%. Chef, 96%. Waiters, 94%. Paralegals, 94%. Tour guides, important for Prague, 91%. Bakers, 89%. Bus drivers, 89%. Construction laborers, 88. Veterinary assistants, 86. Security guards, 84. Sailors, 83. Bartenders, 77. Archivists, 76 percent. Carpenters, 72. And lifeguards, 67. There are, of course, some safe jobs. The likelihood that computer algorithms will replace archaeologists by 2033 is only 0.7 percent because their job requires highly sophisticated types of pattern recognition and does not produce huge profits. And it's improbable that corporations or governments will make the necessary investment to automate archaeology within the next 20 years. Try to imagine the future archaeologist digging for traces of her own species in the midst of automated robots. No one is protected from the effect of automation not even artists and curators. Since at least half of the employable population in technologically developed countries will be without work, would it not be the time to reconsider the value of work, which today is still an indicator or simply cause of social well-being? 
In his 2015 book, The Refusal of Work, Rethinking Post-Work Theory and Practice, the theorist David Frame presents an array of arguments and historical examples of how labor gradually became the natural keystone of a functioning society and why, why it is an urgent need of denaturalization. Automation and the fact that in recent decades of neoliberalism, employment does not necessarily guarantee social and economic well-being are among the key factors why it is worthwhile rethinking and trying to change this deep-rooted dogma of work. As unemployment decreases today and in the future, David Frame suggests looking back at ideas of resistance to work or the just distribution of work. Introduced by theorists such as Andre Vox and Led Marcuse, the Italian autonomous movement, and the contemporary feminist author, Kathy Weeks. What all these ideas have in common is the notion that the only possible way out of this crisis of work has to be political, rather than technological or economic. As an example, one of Andre Gorg's best known ideas is the politics of time. Instead of concentrating the entirety of work inside a small group of people, and as a result overloading it, and leaving the rest with no work or income, he suggests a more equitable redistribution of the workload among the population. This way, everyone could work <coughs> shorter hours, avoid exhaustion, and yet still be, be part of the society and the system. But that is the future. Let us go back to the present, to the ever overgrowing company of automated <coughs> operators around us. Let us go back to contingency. In this internal <coughs> collective, surrounded by automated co-workers and helpers at home, on the road, or in the sky, will absolutely be in need to come up with new forms of responsibility and accountability. In events generated by second nature and contingency, it will be more and more difficult to put a finger on who's at fault, who's to take responsibility and how much. If an industrial robot carrying an app carrying out accurately programmed command, malfunctions, and causes an accident, then the company that implemented the robot in workspace is held responsible. Simple enough. Yet, it can get complicated if an unexpected malfunction cannot be explained even by experts. It is true that layers and layers of artificial neurons intricate, intricate so much computation that it is hard to look back into such structures and found out where and how a specific decision was computed. Artificial neural networks are regarded as black boxes because they have little to no ability to explain causation or which features are important in generating an inference like classification. The programmer has often no control over which features are extracted as they are deduced by the neural networks on its own. It gets even more complicated in the case of autonomous automated technology capable of independent decisions. Even the European Parliament Committee on Legal Affairs has passed an extensive report on civil law rules on robotics, proposing a personal good status for robots. This would include artificial intelligence in the legal framework, making it easier to define responsibilities in unfortunate accidents. Interestingly, the authors of this study have proposed this to base this post-human robot including framework on sci-fi writer Isaac Asimov famous three laws of the robotics, dating back to 1942. Law number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come into harm. Law, law number two, a robot must obey the orders given by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Law number three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. A robot may not harm humanity or by an action allow humanity to come to harm. Yet if you look at science fiction examples in literature or in film, it seems that it's actually those mental Bartleby's, disobedient to man, able to do but preferring not to, robots that are sort of human phantasm of artificial life. It is through this contingency a crack and smooth operation that we actually attribute true autonomy to these artificial entities. 
Robots that disobey. Suicidal robots. Robots gone collectively insane. <laughs> Perhaps it's not their staggering ability to process huge amounts of information, to make calculations or build virtual reality models, but namely spontaneous, meaning the refusal to follow a predetermined outline, considered an imperfection in robotics, that can become a common ground in this robot-human relationship, especially since the very notion of automaton etymologically entails two seemingly opposite but in fact almost synonymous traits, automatism and spontaneity, thus erasing the line between program and accidental. If automatic is an invariable reaction to a fixed type of stimuli, then spontaneity is unexpected, variable, and most important, emotional response to an immediate stimuli. Can there be a program spontaneity? Can one program an emotional response to an unexpected, unforeseen reaction, a creative rupture in monotonous script. Humor is one of such peculiar human features that requires continuity. It requires a breach in logic, in simple input-output scheme. Some specialists even see humor as the final frontier for artificial intelligence, because it requires mastery of sophisticated functions like self-awareness, empathy, spontaneity, and linguistic subtlety. Albeit computational humor is quite recent branch of computational linguistics and artificial intelligence, which uses computers in human research, with the first dedicated conference organized only in 1996, computer programs got quite well advanced in generating fairly simple, fun type of jokes. It is because of the vast amount of data they are now able to gather and process through internet. Yet their jokes are often so alien, so strange. They seem to have developed their own sense of humor, <laughs> unachievable for any human comedian. Take this, for example. <clears throat> what do you call a strange market? A bizarre bazaar. <laughs> <laughs> a digital humor. Artificial sense of humor, but based completely on, on the history and sources of human wit. Just wonder how would artificial intelligences throw jokes among each other? What kind of humor would they develop if there wasn't any connection to human wit? If they were not infused with verbal language? How would a night in a computational humor comedy club look like? Maybe if we try to put it in sound, a more abstract language than verbal, it might sound something like this. <laughs> This is the velocity in which trading algorithms deal with each other on the stock market. However, the difference is that the artificial jokes are generated as accidental byproduct of learning rather than a conscious understanding of why some things are funny and why not, and why a certain linguistic pattern is hilarious in a specific situation. 
Of course, we can always say that humor is not universal. It is based on class, nation, race, and other important factors. But the fact is that even if some jokes are not funny to another group, and vice versa, humans manage to consciously understand why it is the case. Or if we put it in the words of Umberto Eco, no algorithm exists for the metaphor, nor can a metaphor be produced by the means of computers' precise instructions, no matter what the volume of organized information to be fed in. Eco stressed that algorithms are not able to escape the straitjacket of the categories <coughs> that are implicitly or explicitly embodied by the organized information of the data set. Inventing a new method <coughs> is about making a leap and connecting categories that never happen to be logically related. Breaking a linguistic rule is the invention of a new rule, only when it encompasses the creation of a more complex order in which the old rule appears as a simplified and primitive case. Neural networks can a posteriori compute metaphors, but cannot a priori automate the invention of new metaphors without falling into comic results such as random text generation. The automation, automation of strong abduction remains the philosopher's stone of artificial intelligence. Like humor, metaphor requires a leap in thought. It requires a spontaneous break from the template-based thinking from a predetermined program. In a sense, it requires irrationality, a productive mistake, perhaps. Interestingly enough, both artificial and biological humor, humor is directly related to malfunction. The first computer model of sense of humor was suggested by Suslov as early as 1992. Investigation of the general scheme of information processing shows the possibility of specific malfunction, conditioned by the necessity of a quick deletion from consciousness of a false version. This specific malfunction can be identified with humorous effect on psychological grounds. It exactly corresponds to incongruity resolution theory. However, an essentially, essentially new ingredient, the role of timing, is added to the well-known role of ambiguity. In biological systems, a sense of humor inevitably develops in the course of evolution because its biological functions consist of quickening the transmission of the process information into consciousness and in a more effective use of brain resources. A realization of this algorithm in neural networks justifies naturally Spencer's hypothesis on the mechanism of laughter. Deletion of a false version corresponds to zeroing some part of the neural network. An excessive energy of neurons is thrown on the motor cortex, arousing muscular contractions. Providing the human technology relation was born out of mistake, a contingency. Perhaps this very limitation of the human body could offer more than we tend to admit. Perhaps inefficiency and productivity, <coughs> the rejection of strict qualifications could provide beneficial in thinking about well-being in this post-human community of the future. After all, it was our limitations due to the Prometheus forgetfulness that forced us to seek help beyond ourselves, to look for tools as extension of our bodies, language arguably being one of them. Our flaws made us social. Paradoxically, robots based on human anatomy are also the clumsiest. They have difficulty climbing stairs, they fall down turning a doorknob, they fail to grasp irregular shaped objects. However, sometimes limitations of robotic bodies and software allow to create and nurture a specific kind of relationship between human and technology. A relationship that the head of the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University, Manuel Veloso, calls symbiotic autonomy. This quasi-autonomy generates interdependency between people and technology. This way preventing such horror scenarios as we often see and read in the sci-fi visions. Technology thus because it becomes us as dependent on human as we are dependent on it now. At the same time, it is no wonder that some engineers have started looking into different body shapes, dogs, octopuses, dragonflies. <laughs>
By finally getting off our, our anthropocentric pedestal, we have a chance to learn things that other life forms do pretty effortlessly, while we require entire infrastructures, resources, and technologies, from internet of fungi to the octopus ability to edit its own DNA according to the environment. solidly with economic and technological means. It has to be created politically and collectively. Only the collective must not and cannot be exclusive to humans alone. It must include other non-human agents, knowledge, skills, and sensitivities. From octopuses to bacteria, to elegantly fast algorithms, and tireless silicon bodies. Agency. They are uh, kind of working in a sense to 
make uh, explainable uh, algorithms or uh, make them kind of explain their decisions and show the path of how they made the so it's more like specific it's, it's kind of open decision. source. Sorry? But it's more like it's not open source. Like it's a black box in the sense like it's private property. No, it's a black box in the sense that uh, it's difficult to trace at what point the algorithm made a specific, the neural network made a specific decision. Uh, it's very important in this, uh, uh, yeah, automated uh, self-driving cars and things like that, where it's going to be completely uh, detached from any human interference. Yeah. So it's and and especially in military operations when the drones decide to. But I mean, like they are recording the, their decision. The, the that I don't know. Yeah, well, I know. Like ah, okay. they are they are recording the decisions, and like if something bad happened, they can go back and they can have look like why does it happen? Like so, you can really tell. But maybe the problem is like this ability to look into uh, what was going on in the neural network is um, you know available. It's not available for uh, for a public. I would say like the company itself can analyze it and they will know what exactly happened. But uh, will they publish it? I don't know. You should write to Mikhail Poskinelli. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, his whole article is based about this uh, this idea of. Uh, Impossibility to, to trace uh, the decisions in neural networks. But it's probably like few years back, right? It's not like. Um, can you take a year or two years? Oh. Okay, he'll know first then. And also, <coughs> it's good to view more. Like, I like your point. Mm -hmm. But also, like, I was thinking, like, um, is it like too much anthropomorphization? Uh, we are, you know, like, you are forcing the machine to produce something. Maybe it's not natural for it. Or yeah, I think that's um, almost uh, the main point that we were trying to say that uh, the humor that they're developing is completely based on human resources. And uh, that's why we are asking, kind of speculating, how would, what kind of humor would they develop if it was not uh, related to human. Uh, Humor history or resources and uh, the data that they gather, and yeah, this uh, sound piece was a speculative uh, imagination of uh, <coughs> of algorithms. But yeah, I completely agree, and uh, we had this discussion actually in Paris as well about uh, the talk. The talk there was about artificial imagination, and. Uh, there was also this question about if we're not uh, kind of trying to talk about imagination only from a human point of view, and uh, we try to make uh, artificial imagination very human imagination still, and how, how would it look if we actually gave it uh, for the artificial intelligence uh, to develop on its own? And it seems like uh, we're not letting it do it yet. Somehow, or we don't know how to do that. It's still very much based on human categories in many ways, and the humor as well. <coughs> Sorry? Dream. Artificial dream? <laughs> but dream as a, as a projection of the future, or dream as what you dream at night? <coughs> Which one? Yes, like a night dream. A night dream. Yeah, this is Philip Dick. If you're too shy, we can switch off the light and stop <laughs> in the formal way. It's, it's really
how could <laughs> this be applied to some like development of the visual things? I think it's being it's being applied already for a while. Um, I think many artists are using this as their creative tool actually. Even the organizer of the talk in Paris is also working uh, with this uh, technology of uh, of glitch and uh, of what they uh, of what the algorithms are producing themselves with the input of specific uh, images or information. And yeah, it's it's been done already for quite a while, I think. and of course it's changing and it's going to change and. It's already changing our perception of of the image. Today, everything is no filter, so it's already very much filtered. So you need to emphasize when it's no filter. So, yeah. Yeah. Just so how, how are you introducing the uh, human limitation in your art? Uh, you are producing. I mean, like, what is your weakness that you are putting on display? Like, because of the strategy you, you want to pursue? Uh, I think we always try to emphasize uh, the importance of body in the development of the technologies and to show that uh, our human uh, body limitations can be productive in the sense that uh, being limited uh, forces you to always seek uh, help beyond yourself. Uh, it always seeks you to become social, both social as with other human and non-human entities. So um, it's about being dependent on each other. So it's this idea of not imagining oneself as this autonomous subject that is just en enhancing oneself, but or allowing these technologies to develop on their own. You know, it's very much about emphasizing the limitation of our bodies and what they can offer in this development of human technology relationship. Can I ask you something completely different about your practice a little bit? Like you said you were doing also you had a space in Lithuania and how does how do you work like on how many fields do you how do you split your work actually and how do you organize yourself? How do you work together as well? Mm -hmm. 24 hours. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We just work a lot. No, I mean, like oh, you, you organize the space. You uh, have a space. Where, can you say something about the space? Yeah, the space is uh, completely detached from our practice. It's uh, okay. it's a, it's a space called editorial in Vilnius, and uh, it it it's the name uh, came because there are two editorial desks in the same space, and it's dedicated more to practices that uh, focus on communication and language and text. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we have six exhibitions related to that. And it's, uh, it, it's detached from our practice. Uh, maybe writing is more inclusive in, in our practice in these lectures. But it's not, uh, what we did, it's not in, uh, a piece, it's, um, it's a lecture. So, so, and how we work, I mean, uh, basically it's very much about uh, sharing the ideas the whole time. There is no uh, direct kind of uh, strict uh, division of work, who's doing what. I mean, maybe I do the talking. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, it's not that... Ugnus is going to the studio and doing the materials and I do something else. It's, we always do everything together. And it's very much about adding things on top of each other and also criticizing each other's ideas equally, which is painful. But uh, yes, it's very organic, I would say. What was the reaction in Harry on, the, on your speech? Like it, uh, it was similar. Like I was told, like this was extended, enhanced, and uh, overly super. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, like uh, were they like surprised? Was it like something new for them? Or uh, it was uh, to 
together with another uh, philosopher, French philosopher, Catherine Malabou. Mm -hmm. And she was speaking more from a philosophical point of view about imagination uh, and materiality of imagination, but she was talking about Emmanuel Sergenas. And then afterwards, it was a discussion of, for one hour about what is artificial imagination and um, I think we ended up uh, coming to the same conclusion about this two human uh, artificial imagination, that this artificial imagination is still too human in a sense. Uh, and the reaction, it was very engaging um, discussion actually, I didn't expect it, it was very Sure. One hour. Yeah. I have also a question. Um, like, like you say that you sort of are um, for embracing the other. Uh, and today, um, the politics run the other way around. Like, especially here in Chicago, but I think it's global that people sort of think that they need to protect from the other side. Do you get political? Uh, I think we are trying to emphasize this idea that, uh, especially in this uh, uh, technological development, that is still very neoliberal kind of uh, idea of, of technology. That is. Uh, it seems that uh, all the problems can be solved either by economy or by technology. And we try to emphasize that they should be, first of all, uh, solved politically. And uh, it has to be uh, a matter of politics rather than uh, of businessmen uh, or <coughs> technology geeks. And uh, we're very much about pro-politics, but politics that uh, includes, like we said, uh, uh, includes the social, which is not only human, but uh, other non-human entities as well. And I think with the development of artificial intelligence, it should include artificial beings as well. So you are saying you think like you would uh, give artificial machines some citizen privileges, or like think about them in a, in a sense as uh, beings to be Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, we quoted that uh, uh, the European Parliament on Legal Affairs, mm -hmm. they made a study on, on the robotics, and they suggest to give uh, personhood status to artificial intelligence. Really? Because it's, it's, <laughs> it's the only way to also uh, make them responsible. You know, to, to take them into the legal framework rather than allow them. It's like, how would you punish? How would you punish? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is uh, extensive uh, studies are being uh, done. With us. Yeah, because if you switch switch it off, it's a, is it a murder? No, it's uh, <laughs> no. But is there, these are the questions that are being asked, actually. Because uh, like, how far can you go with? Keeping it, oh, it's just an algorithm. I mean, well, it's a, if it's a person, it's a it's a person somehow, just on a different <coughs> scale. No, not yet. No, not yet, definitely. But uh, it's something that um, there are studies after studies on that, and we would need, we would need to make a PhD if we want to <laughs> talk about that. But it's 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 been discussed widely already. And so, what it would exactly help? Like, I, I get like it's not for the AI itself, but maybe it's for like to push uh, politically for some action. But like, if you if you um, gave the human status to AI, then you are unable to do what with that. Like, I, I think I like imagination. No, I think it's uh, it was more not that well. First of all, probably you cannot harm them, just like they cannot harm you. That's the, that's the funny thing that they base this uh, this um, kind of uh, legal framework on sci-fi writer. You know, so in a sense, uh, sci-fi is is going to shape our legal framework of the future. 
and this uh, is like a theme of uh, the loss of the robotics are the main background now for uh, suggested by, by these experts um, as this basis for developing a new legal framework for this uh, human non human relationship. And uh, it's one thing is us, we shouldn't harm them, and at the same time, it's also asking responsibility and accountability from their part. If I mean, it's very much related to also autonomous self driving cars and all these uh, autonomous uh, yeah, entities that are going to be less and less dependent on human and make their own uh, uh, decisions. So it's about. Uh, yeah, making them responsible as well, and making us responsible for them, towards them. But it's still a study, it's, it's a proposition, and it's being uh, now considered in the European Parliament, so it's very interesting that it actually came on this level. It's not that it's just we're fantasizing on it, but it's, it's something that uh, they're, it's, it's very urgent to think about these questions already. But isn't it kind of ridiculous that I mean, the most of the sophisticated technology goes exactly against the rules that Asimo proposed, and that we are trying to, you know, make, for example, drones that are de developed to kill people take their own responsibility? I think it's in, in its core it's just a way of taking away the re responsibility of the manufacturer or the creator of those algorithms. You know, it's it's I think it's a very malicious gesture. I, I don't see anything pretty good in it, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, that's what we were saying, that it shouldn't be in the hands uh, of basically uh, business people or military. It should be in the hands uh, of social politics and public uh, politics. And. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. What can I say? <laughs> I totally agree, and this is what we're trying to, to say in the talk as well. I believe that the public interest or the social interest doesn't have enough power to fight you know, the, the, the economical power that we are facing at this point. And the fact that most of the most advanced technology is built by the extra high economical power. Um, if everything was built in the way as you proposed, you know, we wouldn't have any crimes in the world and any less problems. Yeah, I mean, raising awareness is one of the ways to, yeah, make people aware and make people more conscious rather than just being uh, consumers. But I think, like, people don't care. I mean, like, I, I wouldn't see my success in raising awareness about privacy um, and, like, how people share data. Uh, and so on. So, what what I see in a trend is like you are, you know, like getting away your rights and you don't care that much yeah. as long as you are, you know, fine in your day to day basis. So, I don't see you know, like much success in this area. What can I do? I mean, <laughs> I'm just an artist trying to pass <laughs> by. <laughs> if people don't care, I'm not going to force them to care, you know, somehow. I, I care. You care probably, but... Tomorrow morning revolution. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's, that's the thing. It's, uh, this caring is not, or not caring. This, uh, it comes with, uh, with this disappointment in uh, protests in general. You know? Because the people just see that it doesn't give anything. Like, uh, in many cases, they... Mm -hmm. People go on the streets, they protest, but then the next day it's business as usual somehow. And uh, it's this capital, capitalist realism, if we say in Mark Fisher terms, that make youth completely, not only youth, but people just completely inactive and paralyzed. It's just that capitalism subsumes every protest in itself somehow. So you feel kind of hopeless, so we just go on and you kind of zone out in your own <coughs> private bubble with your iPhone and your music and things like that.
very sad ending. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it's not supposed to be. We try to have happy end, but. <laughs>